Welcome everyone, good morning. So today I am very excited because, uh, well, I'm first gonna repeat my name, I'm Grace Cuevas, and I'm very excited to be here. I wanna thank uh, all the organizing committee for inviting me, especially because this is my first Berlin Buzzwords. So before getting started, you're gonna be hearing more about me in a few minutes, so before we jump into that, I would love to hear from you. So I'm gonna be asking a few questions and I would love to see hands up, or if you prefer, you can also stand up. That's gonna help your, your blood get flowing, wake up. So first question I have, as I mentioned, this is my first Berlin buzzword, so who else is here for the first time? Very good. How, like, how many of you haven't missed a single Berlin buzzword since it started? So it has been here for 10, for 10 years. Okay, a few. Yes, old timers. So who uh, here in the, in, in, in the room today have come from somewhere in Germany or is local? Good. How many of you have flown from another country? So this is great. Yay, so I'm not the only jet lagged. Um, so now I want to learn a little bit more about your journey in open source. So how many of you contribute to open source project as a hobby? This means you don't get paid for less. You just do it because it's fun, you love the community, and you love spending time in the industry. Okay? How many of you do it as a full-time job, or as a part of your job? Okay, so it's like half and half. That's good. All right. So the last question I have, how many of you contribute code to your open source projects? Good. How many of you contribute any type of uh, either community management or project management contributions? Yeah. How many of you contribute to documentation? Okay, a few. All right. So this was very helpful. We have a very healthy mix of everybody doing uh, contributions from like code to non-code contributions. That's very cool. People from Germany, people from outside. This is a really, really good uh, community. So okay, today's talk it's going to be about playing fair in open source, and it's going to be me sharing my story and my open source journey. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be sharing like how these two years that I've been doing contributions to open source have been for me and for the communities I participate in. So yesterday, Isabel mentioned that when we contribute to open source, we often do it with more than one hat. And it's good to know like, what hat are we wearing when we talk about things. So I'm gonna tell you about the two hats that I normally wear when I contribute to open source. The first one is not a leprechaun um, hat, it's just one type of hat. It is a Google Cloud. And Google Cloud is because it's my employer, and it's the company that gave me the opportunity to contribute to open source. Second hat is my personal individual open source contributor. And it turns out that in addition to the time that I dedicate to open source as part of my day-to-day -day job, I also spend time doing things that I like, such as contributing to communities and advocating for diversity and inclusion in them. So with these two hats, I want you to remember them, the leprechaun hat and the magic hat. I'm gonna be putting them in the corner of the slides in every section so you understand what is the context that I am sharing my, my experiences in. So about this talk. So first I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna be sharing with you a little bit about who I am and how I ended up contributing to open source. Then I'm gonna tell you about how Google interacts in the open source landscape. Then I'm gonna share with you my Apache Beam story. And I say my Apache Beam story because it's the project in which I started contributing to open source. It was also the community that has helped me grow into this industry. I'm gonna share what I learned, and these are lessons that were either joyful or like good, good growing pains. And I'm gonna uh, share a few anecdotes with them. After that, I'm gonna tell you about open source participation models that I identify from different commercial vendors we interact with at Apache Beam. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide some recommendations to play fair in the open source industry. And, to, and in the end, I'm gonna share a few best practices that we have implemented at Google to help open source practices be more fair, not only for the people in the projects, but also for our employees. 
Okay, so who I am. So I am Gris Cuevas, again. <laughs> and, that mean, and I am a Googler, which technically means that I am also a Googler mom. And also here on stage today with me is Boo, who's another Googler who hold on, let me have on the stage today. He is a two-year-old bo boxer, and I love him so much. So I always bring it to my presentations. But who else I am? My background in technology started 13 years ago. I have experience in tech management that goes from oil rigs. I initially had, I started my career in uh, deep water operations, and then I moved to big data. For, through these 13 years, I've seen similar practices in technology we needed, and they are around technology management, project management, and team management. I am also an aspiring data scientist. Last year, I, I ended my grad degree in data science, and a few of my colleagues, including Holden, have been very patient with me when I need to do data science tasks. So I say that I'm an aspiring data scientist because I haven't dedicated full time to do it, but in my free time, I try to do more and more. And I also have eight years of experience with online and volunteer communities. Previously, before doing open source, I was working for the top contributor program in Google, which is basically our product expert um, programs that recognize people who help others in, in online communities. So because of these three skills and my background, two years ago, the head of open source strategy at Google invited me to join the team and help build a strategy for some of our open uh, big data and machine learning projects. That is how I ended up becoming an open source strategist. And that is also why I advocate for what is known code contributions in the industry. So that is me, and that is like the, the, the history that put me into contributing to open source. So now, let's talk about what Google does in the open source landscape. The first lesson I learned when I joined Google Cloud and I started doing open source with Google, is that open source is not free as sunshine. It's more like free like a puppy. <laughs> and the analogy is that even when you get a puppy for your birthday or for Christmas, you still need to invest in the puppy, not only to keep him alive, but also to help him grow healthy and strong. It's some sort of commitment that you need to do, even if you didn't pay for the puppy. So because that lesson, that was the first lesson that Sarah Novotny, who was my boss at the time, uh, like helped us understand, our team understood that open source is more important now than ever. And the reason why is because it's an enabler for innovation in technology, and it actually enables like, great technologies to be created in a faster way and with a more like, diverse opinions and ideas. It helps technologies move faster. And it's not the same like developing a, a new set of like, code or technologies just on its own, either by, as an individual or an organization, than when you do it with partners who are all the time contributing with you. So in 2017, that is the year that I joined Google Cloud, Google had the following participation in, in open source. We had over 47,000 repositories in GitHub that had an event recorder made by a Googler. We also have over 1 billion of interaction of a Googler in either a pull request or comments in Google issues. We also represented almost 1% of all the GitHub's pull requests and that, and that were made by a Googler. And lastly, over 5,500 5, Googlers contributed to open source projects in, in GitHub. So with all of that, and all of these contributions to open, uh, open source happen in a broader spectrum of projects. And here are some examples of them. In total, we contributed 20 million lines of open source code. And the project that brought me to open source was Apache Beam. So now I'm going to tell you what was my story with the project. And just to remind you, the little hat there is, this is a personal experience. This is not necessarily how I was uh, interacting as a Googler. So what is Apache Beam? Apache Beam is a unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. 
How did Apache Beam became an open source project? Everything started with a paper, with a MapReduce paper that was published by, by Google and open sourced. After that paper, Google continued to innovate on in projects, but at the same time, the open source ecosystem continued to evolve with multiple other projects. So in 2016, Apache Beam became a reality. And the timeline is here. So in 2016, in, in February of 2016, we entered the Apache Incubator. And just roughly after a year, we graduated as a project. I didn't participate in this process. That was the, the engineering team that was working on it. I actually joined the, the, the project almost a year and a half after they entered incubation. And when they invited me to join, I had the task of help grow the, pro the project. I didn't know what this meant in open source. So this was my, my perception of what I needed to do. Be a superhero who will help the community grow just as I did uh, with previous communities. But instead, after a few months of trying things that I thought will work, I felt like this. I did multiple things that not only burned the attempts, but also our intentions as a commercial vendor to contribute to open source. This wasn't our fault. It was more like it was a new project. It was the first time that Google actually donated a project to the Apache Server Foundation. The, the engineering team wasn't very familiar with open source. I wasn't very familiar with open source. And we didn't pay attention to what, how the community wanted to integrate all of our contributions and how we wanted to grow the community. So what we, what we did, what, like what I did one day, was actually reflect on why things that I tried before in my previous experience as a community manager and technology manager didn't work. And these are four of the lessons that I learned doing, during that journey. So the first lesson is that not everyone is open source ready. And this include your engineering team, but also the community members that you might be helping collaborate in the project. Why is not everybody open source ready? Sometimes you work with technical teams that are focused on producing technology, but you don't consider about other skills that are not as evident when contributing in open source. Some of those skills like represent people being vulnerable, vulnerable from working in the open and exposing things that might not be perfect and that might be called out as not good or quality. And being vulnerable do not, doesn't only come with how good of a coder you are, but also how good of a speaker you are for English, for instance, if it's not your native language. It's also vulnerable because it brings more of your styles exposed to the open just as a code that it's open source. Another, another skill that is not as obvious and sometimes it's hard for people is communication. Just as Isabel mentioned yesterday too, the Apache Server Foundation prefers asynchronous communication, which sometimes means that the person contributing to open source needs to be very clear and very concise, something that is hard and sometimes we don't even have time to write an email that it's gonna take us an hour to get perfect. So that just brings more challenges to, to contributing in open source. So that was the first lesson that I learned. And often because the emails that I wrote will be sometimes perceived as too corporate and sometimes to be perceived as too informal. So I learned it that way. The other lesson that I learned is that tooling and development practices actually impact velocity for everyone. And the reason why it impacts everyone is because different people have internal development tools that are not compatible with the open source world. And this also reflects in development processes. So the release, the release timelines for one project might be very different to what release timelines look like internally. And when you're a commercial vendor, that, even, that multiplies even more if, you, if your product launch actually depends on project releases. And this just adds more complication when you need to communicate with people, when you need to negotiate on what gets released, who gets to cut the release, how you get to do it, etc. And when you are not aware of all these dependencies being added to the dynamics of the conversation, this also adds more, more like sticky and sticking points to, to how you build open source. The third lesson I learned is that it doesn't matter how important your company goals are project goals should always come first. 
and that's why I put one of these um, dolls here, because when you are convinced that the doll that you have is the, the largest, you continue to open it, and you realize that there's always a goal that is bigger, and you should keep in mind that the project should come first. So one story uh, that reflects this with Apache Beam was that even though Google donated the, the, the code for Apache Beam, what we really wanted was for more people to adopt it and contribute to it. So oftentimes we needed to sacrifice our own timelines to put the project first. And the team that has been working for Beam all this time has had this at heart. This wasn't easy. We needed to work together to, to accept this cultural change and make, it, and make it part of how we implement a development culture in our engineering teams. And the last lesson that I learned is that diversity in maintainer community is key. So when Apache Beam got into the incubator, and it was only the, the Google team, we didn't have more players in the game to distribute maintain it, like maintenance tasks, like project management or community management. We rarely had people doing advocacy for the project, which also added more and more load to our engineers. So we understood that to get diversity in maintainers, we also needed to give, to respect their opinions, their voices, and understand their own goals for the project. So this is something that we have kept at heart for Apache Beam as a community. So now I'm wearing my Apache hair. Uh, Apache Beam hat. We try to, um, to get people from the community involved in the maintenance of the project, not only in the code, but also in other things like advocacy. So with those four lessons, another thing that I had the opportunity to observe were the different type of participation models that commercial vendors have in open source. This is something that I learned, especially with Apache Beam, because the more we wanted to be open and welcoming for our other partners, we identified that the purposes and the reasons that every one of them had were, were different. I want to give a shout out here to Merle Krantz, who actually worked with me on defining these models, and I'm going to share them with you. So before going into the models, I just want to do a recap of what are the economics of open source for these commercial vendors. So the definition that we have here is the definition that everybody knows for open source. Open source software has a license that enables anyone to study the code, change it, or use it in any way they want. It's free of use. The difference between open source software and an open source project is that an open source project actually develop, allows development in public and in the open. So how does that look like? This is almost comparing uh, oranges to apples. Open source software is just software that has an open source, a, a license to allow people to use it as they want. And an open source project allows for development. So how does it look? You have open source software, you add collaborative public development, and you allow several people to actually change the technology, and that's how you get open source projects. So an open source project actually has three components. It has maintainers, it has the users, it has a technology. And all of them interact in, si in feedback cycles that actually enable the, com the technology and community to, get to mature and become bigger and move in a life cycle. So now the commercial vendor participation models. Taking this into consideration, we are talking about three types of commercial vendors participation. The first ones are companies that use open source software, either to create other pro uh, products that they are going to commercialize, or just to use it to build their own value at it. Right? Like if you need to, to do some testing, you use an open source project instead of building yours. Similar use cases. The other, the other commercial vendor model, the other participation model, is companies that sponsor open source projects or foundations. There are companies that dedicate funds to support open source foundations, so more open source projects are built, and not everybody needs to reinvent the wheel. One time, somebody asked me what I did or what open source was, and I gave this analogy of 
Imagine that you need to build a house, and every time you need to build a house, you also need to build the bricks. That is not scalable. So open source is almost showing everybody to build bricks, so you don't need to start from there when you need to build your house. The third model is companies that employ people to, uh, to contribute to open source projects. And this is like more involvement on not only the resources for the economic resources to sustain open source, but also time and manpower to help projects develop. So with these three models, I'm going to share with you some recommendations on how a commercial vendor, regardless of what model of contribution they use, can play, can play fairly in open source. So for commercial vendors who use open source, the first recommendation that I will have is that endorse the projects by sharing your use case. If you, are, if you are a user of a technology that is open source, oftentimes sharing your use case with the public, it's what will help a project get more in their branding. It's helping them get credibility, and also it's an endorsement of like, a company believing in the technology. I know that oftentimes it might be daunting and you might not know how to do it, but you can approach the projects and ask them about what would be useful for them. One, um, one case that we had is that um, when you want to build brand, it's very hard to, to pay for like PR or actually creating just use cases and we're not. But if you have someone that is very enthusiastic about your project attending a conference and giving a talk, that it might be all that it takes for them to actually start hearing about the, community, the technology and get ideas in how they can employ your, the, your project to solve use cases. The second recommendation is provide feedback. If you're, using, if you're just using a technology and you find a lot of bugs or you have ideas in how to improve it, or even just have requests in how development of the project will make your life better, don't be shy, share it. And just by raising your voice, you will help, you will help the project prioritize what is important for users and also identify areas where they can grow towards. Just provide the, the gift of feedback. So for commercial vendors who sponsor open source projects, one recommendation that we have is consider targeted donations. So if you're already donating to a foundation, but there is something that you would like to have that foundation improve on, think about what are things that you could help happen. For example, use case building. If you want to collaborate with them by sharing your story, just approach them, offer to work with your PR team or your marketing team to build a really nice use case or study case that they can use for branding, that is a way to help that is not necessarily monetary. Also, if you have offices in other parts of the world and you would like to create community engagement, you can offer your, your offices or your people to give talks, have meetups, and help them have a presence in that region. Another recommendation is to explore opportunities to contribute upstream. And this is, if you're already sponsoring a project and you're using it, you should explore how can you actually contribute to the development of the project. This doesn't only mean to contribute to the core technology with code. You can also do it by hiring uh, like developer advocates or people who are um, community managers or project managers to help accelerate the growth and development of a technology. So that is one example with like, our roles at Google, is that we, our, our, intention is our, our intention is to build tools and processes that enable projects to grow healthy and to grow faster. So the last model and set of recommendations is for commercial vendors who hire maintainers. And this is probably one of the, of the most complicated ones. So the first one is integrate the contributions to career development. Career development is sometimes, like in engineering teams especially, looks only at the amount and quality of code that you contribute to the project. 
but it doesn't take into account all the other skills that we were talking about previously. It doesn't take into account how effective communicator you are, or what is the complexity of a new feature or a new advance or your, uh, a new contribution that you're trying to make. You also need to pay attention to these extra efforts and the, the value that someone is creating, not only for your portion of the project, but to the ecosystem as a whole. This is a conversation that often comes up, especially within our teams, and we are open to help them get better value to that. The second recommendation is invest in compatible tooling and development processes. I know it's hard to decide to not use your internal tooling when you're contributing to open source, but often time is the right decision. If you think about development velocity and investment, not only in the, t in the amount of time that you're ex spending to build open source, but also to rework, doing the work first internally and then refactoring it to be open source ready, it's a lot of, of rework that it's not only affecting your team, but also the project. So even though it might look daunting and very challenging, it might be better to think about moving at least your open source dedicated teams to development processes and tools that are broadly used, not only for you. And now, after reviewing the different models and having some recommendations, I'm going to go back to my experience with Apache Beam, and I'm going to share with you how we are building good open source citizenship within Google. So the first thing we did after that rocket picture of how I felt with a fail uh, takeoff, we spent time investigating what were our sticking points, what got us stuck, and what gave us all this growing pains in contributing to open source. So what we did was we surveyed our teams working with open source, and we asked them, what were, the what were the points where they felt stuck? Or what were the points where they felt they were spending a lot of time with things that could be improved? And these were the answers. The first one is that open source contributions should be included in performance reviews. And again, this was very important because contributing to open source requires a, a different skill set that oftentimes is not incorporated in technical ladders reviews. The second one was open source training. And this was related to, imagine that you are a software engineer who are really excited because you just landed your first job after computer science school. Interacting in open source, I'm pretty sure that is not something that it's taught in all schools. Or you might have not even been comfortable doing it because you have never done it. So if you are hired for a team that contributes to open source without knowing what to do, it's very likely that you're not going to feel comfortable and you're going to be very intimidated. And if not, maybe it just comes natural to you and you shall mentor the others. But open source training was the, number, the second thing our engineers requested. And the, third, and the third point was compatible tooling. Again, one of the biggest pains that we have internally were one of these ones, uh, we do a lot of internal integrations and we're not, and they wanted to have more compatibility with the open source world. So what we did was we launched an Apache Google program, which pretty much is a team of program managers who support our engineering teams contributing to open source with developing processes, tools, and also like trainings and resources for them to be able and better prepared to interact in open source. We also help them when there are things that we need to, to do more specifically in the projects, like project management, we do issue triage, we help prioritize what the community is giving us feedback. We help with event and, and community engagement. So we help with more like of a platform for them to continue and be efficient in how they contribute to open source. So what we did with this was actually creating a sense of internal community. We help people feel together and, help and, and feel integrated into a community within Google that, were, that had the same objective of being good citizens when contributing to open source. Just this year, a few months ago, two months ago, 
we hosted our first internal Apache Google Summit, and it was great because we got a few different teams within Google contributing to Apache projects with different level of expertise and different, and different challenges or different um, priorities in the projects. It was a good way for them to, con to share stories, share ideas, and start conversations that now are changing things within the company. And we hopefully influence the, the open source ecosystem in, in a better way. So with this, uh, I had a slide of shout outs of people who have collaborated with me in contributing to Apache Beam, my open source journey, putting together some of the resources that we have had here, mentoring me in a way. And I just wanted to also mention that I was really pleased to see that this list is only women, which it was very satisfying. Um, it's people who are working to make open source a better place. And yes, yeah, so that's the shout out. So before opening the floor to questions, I'm going to share my two business cards. This is my corporate hat contact if you are interested in learning more about how we are doing it from a commercial vendor perspective. And if you are interested in engaging on the open source world, what I love to do for a hobby is advocate for diversity and inclusion. Join the diversity at apache.org mailing list and help us make the, the foundation a more diverse place. And with that, I want to thank everyone, and I would love to open up for questions. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions for Griselda? Don't be shy. <laughs> I guess that's not the case. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference.